Welcome everyone to our Congregational Accompaniment Project for Asylum Seekers or CAPIS webinar following our CAPIS podcast, which I'm hoping y'all got a chance to listen to, but if not, that's quite all right. Um, we're going to talk more about the asylum seeking process in the United States, um, the CAPIS program that UUSC um, supports. And Heather's going to offer some updates on the current situation for asylum seekers. And then we'll hear from Nyoki about how the CAPIS program runs in congregations. Um, so to start with, we will begin with introductions. My name is Laura Randall. I work for UUSC as the Director of Congregation Relations. I use she, her pronouns, and I live in Medford, Massachusetts, just outside of Boston. Heather, would you like to introduce yourself? Absolutely. My name is Heather Vickery. My pronouns are she, her, hers. I am the coordinator for congregational activism at UUSC, um, which means I get to work with congregations that want to do their justice work more effectively and faithfully. Um, and outside of my work here at UUSC, I also co-coordinate a migrant justice bond fund in Massachusetts, as I am also located right outside of Boston, but in the town of Saugus, Mass. Nauke? Yes, my name is Naoki Nakamura. I am living in Racine, Wisconsin, and I'm a member of the Olympia Brown UU Church. I am the chair of the Asylum Seeker Task Force, and I have been uh, privileged to host uh, a family here for a year and a half now. Thank you so much. To begin with, we wanted to let you know what the campus program does, which is we support communities of faith, many of them UU congregations, but not all of them. We have many different faith communities, including communities of no faith at all participating in this program. We just need a group of people and we're supporting them as they host and accompany individuals and families as they seek safety through the process of obtaining legal asylum in the United States. Next slide, please. We wanted to start with some important terms because sometimes these terms are thrown around interchangeably, but they actually do mean different things. So the first one we wanted to start with was refugee. A refugee is someone who's forced to flee their home because of war, violence, or persecution. And for a refugee, an official entity such as a government or the United Nations Refugee Agency determines whether a person seeking international protection meets the definition of a refugee. And those who obtain refugee status are given protections under international laws and conventions. So really, you are a refugee if a government or a UN agency has said you are a refugee. Next slide, please. So how's a refugee different than an asylum seeker? Well, in many ways, they're the same because an asylum seeker is someone forced to flee their home because of war, violence, or persecution. But they do not have this blanket legal designation of refugee from the government or the UN. They have to apply for protection in that country of destination, meaning they have to arrive at the border in order to apply for asylum. There's no way to apply for asylum from outside of the country. And we should all remember that asylum is a human right. It's encoded into international law, into the Universal Declaration of Human Rights from the UN. Asylum is a human right. We need to say that and say it loud because governments, including the United States government, keep uh, not honoring this human right. Next slide, please. All right, the terms migrant and immigrant. So this is often used as an umbrella term for anyone moving from one country to another. This is usually someone who chooses to relocate to a different country for economic, educational, or familial reasons. And in the United States, people have to navigate a lengthy and convoluted vetting process to get visas, permanent residency status, and or citizenship. So it takes a very long time to become an immigrant to the United States. And most migrants or immigrants could safely choose to return to their country of origin. This makes them different than refugees or asylum seekers. Next slide, please. So we're gonna be talking about the CAPIS program. So we're gonna go over the basics of what CAPIS does. So we support congregations to serve as hosts or sponsors for asylum seekers. 
We work with congregations to support family reunifications. Um, this is something we did a lot um, after um, the previous administration left office, and we've been working with the Biden administration to reunite families who are separated. And we work to connect congregations with advocacy work around migrant justice. Next slide, please. There are many different kinds of CAPA solidarity, and we listed some of them here. Um, housing, um, this can be in a congregant's home or in separate housing that perhaps the congregation is supporting, like renting an apartment. Basic needs such as clothing, food, medical care, therapy, legal representation. That's a huge one for asylum seekers. Social connection, we are building communities of welcome. ESL or other language support for people who don't know English when they come to the United States. Transportation needs are a big one and we need a community to help with that. And education support, job training, getting driver's licenses, all these little things that make daily life possible in the United States. Next slide, please. So who can participate in the CAPES program? You can. <laughs> We're looking for congregations or community groups with core teams of four to five people with larger volunteer networks that support those core teams. Next slide, please. There are a lot of things to consider when you want to participate in the CAPAS program. So here are some really important things to consider. Does this fit with or build on your congregations or your community's social justice activities and strengths. What level of anti-racism work have you done? That's important. What is your congregation's willingness to take on a large project which involves significant volunteer time and some fundraising? This is a, a very holistic method of support that we're giving. And is your congregation able to be flexible? We can do a lot of planning, but things are going to change and we have to be able to roll with it. Next slide, please. So here's the CAPAS process if you decide you'd like to move forward. The first is discernment. And that's something that we on the CAPAS team help congregations do is looking at what resources you have, where you're at on your justice journey, and if participating in the CAPAS program is right for you and at what level. After that discernment and you've said yes, you have to build a team. Then you have to identify a housing host. This is not always the case, but it often is. And that's usually the most important type of solidarity we can give to an asylum seeker is housing. There's fundraising. We recommend that congregations raise between five and $7,000 before their guest arrives. Then there's guest matching. That's where you um, meet usually through Zoom meetings, your asylum seeker who's looking for um, a community to relocate to, and you can discuss if this is going to be a good match. And then, of course, your guest arrives. Next slide, please. For our campus congregations, we do have ongoing support provided by the campus team here at UUSC. So we have monthly calls with congregations and communities on Zoom. We have on-call support. So if you have um, issues you'd like to discuss or something you wanna talk through, we're really, we love it when you reach out and we can talk you through those things. We have regular trainings um, on all sorts of things that are related to campus, including advocacy trainings, including um, things like uh, storytelling, ethical storytelling, and how to do really ethical fundraising around supporting your asylum seeker. We also have worship assistance and um, services that we offer to help your congregation learn about what you're doing and get excited about it and want to join in as well. So we have um, worship resources that we can give you and we also have many talented preachers on staff, and we love to come visit you in person and offer these resources. We also have grant funding. So we have for new campus congregations, we will provide a supporting match of $5,000 um, to meet the money that you've already raised when you are bringing on a new asylum seeker into your community. 
So these are some of the basics of the CAPES program. Um, we are going to have time at the end of our time today to talk more and have um, a question and answer period. So if you have questions, please jot them down and we look forward to answering them soon. Um, for now though, I'm going to turn it over to Heather who's gonna to talk to us about some updates to the um, immigration asylum seeking process in the United States since we recorded our podcast almost a year ago. Thanks so much for that, Laura. Yeah, um, if you have been able to uh, check out the podcast, you might recognize my voice. I was um, on the first episode talking about the um, generally the process for, for which people go through to um, ask for asylum in this country. Um, if you haven't yet been able to, to listen to that, I strongly suggest it because it goes through all the sort of difficulties that people tend to, to face. Um, one of the things you'll notice when you listen to that, though, is I mentioned something like uh, Title 42 and how it was ending soon. Um, that ended already. So we have updates. Um, one of the constant things about our immigration system is that it changes and shifts constantly. Um, there are different processes in different locations and for different statuses, as Laura was alluding to with if you're a refugee versus an asylum seeker. Um, and now we have these parole programs for different states. Um, and it makes navigating the system incredibly difficult for anyone, never mind for migrants without access to um, significant resources or community connections. So the things to keep in mind that are happening now is most folks have heard of this Biden's parole program for um, Venezuela, Haiti, Nicaragua, and Cuba. So those are folks coming from those four countries. They, um, they have to apply for this humanitarian parole from their country, get accepted, find a sponsor, and then they will be able to come over and um, have status for two years. Um, a lot of people ask us about this and would like us our support with it. And we'll support anyone doing the work of welcoming folks, but we are not directly integrating with that program, partly because um, when they made that, it wasn't a new way for folks to come to the country. It wasn't a new path. It was replacing their ability to, to effectively apply for asylum, which is a different process. Um, it also, by requiring that folks apply from the country of origin, it means that those folks who are really unsafe there and can't stay cannot go through this program. Um, there have been, um, they say there are exceptions for people. They can come in to the, to the border and apply for an exception using the CBP-1 app. Um, however, this app has been a complete and utter failure. Um, it's generally shuts down after like less than an hour each morning. All the appointments are taken. Um, it's uh, too technologically advanced for many people's phones. Um, it's also, as a lot of facial recognition pieces, um, is racist. It doesn't take. It doesn't recognize really dark-skinned folks um, as people or babies. Um, and then on top of that, um, we've heard instances of families getting appointments where the mother is going to one side of the United States and the father has to go to a completely different place for their appointments. So it's not really um, attached to where they are um, when they are applying. So there's a lot of work to be done. And we, um, we think it's great that a lot of communities are working with that parole program and we're choosing not to because we want to um, continue to build up the right to a seek asylum. And that pathway is important on its own. Um, some of the things that you've undoubtedly heard of that also affect people's actual access to asylum, um, it doesn't always seem like it's a direct connection, but it is. Um, very recently, the Department of Homeland Security under the Biden administration has um, officially waived environmental and other reviews to construct new portions of the border wall, which um, is against Biden's campaign promises um, about this. He's he has said how they're not, um, the wall is not effective. We all know that's not, it's not effective. Um, and more, most importantly, um, there's two pieces here. One, that wall, the pieces that they've waived 
um, reviews for go through indigenous land. Um, some of them sacred, you know, sacred burial grounds and everything. And so um, this is just another way that we are um, failing the indigenous folks of this of this land. Um, the other piece is that this is the wall itself is very much part of this policy that came up during the Clinton administration called prevention through deterrence. Um, and this is the idea that they were going to push people through the most dangerous parts of the desert. Um, so with the idea that they would then not migrate. But the reality is, is that people are in such a situation, they still try. And so all that this has done has meant more people have died in the desert. And so as people are trying to get to get through um, and migrate and, and get out, we are we are just um, making it less likely that folks will survive that that um, journey. Um, we also see um, the busing of migrants from um, southern states like Texas, Florida to cities like New York, Chicago, Boston. Um, this is in an effort to punish liberal cities um, and punish the Biden administration um, and the people who voted Democrat um, for supporting human rights and migrants. Um, but I will say that communities, those communities and, and all of the communities that I've seen are doing amazing, um, amazing jobs trying to meet the needs and push back on this idea that we can't actually support everyone. We do actually have enough resources. Um, we are also seeing just in general an increase in fascist response to migrants, um, even in liberal cities and states, especially as a response to the Haitian migrants who are coming. Um, as we know, they are Black, so it is part of anti-Black racism. Um, and we're seeing even in, in our, Lauren Mai's very own Massachusetts, we have seen um, fascist and neo-Nazis protesting um, motels where Haitians are being housed as they start their process. Um, when we're talking, asylum seekers are often imprisoned for asking for help, right, at some point of their journey. So they are put into detention and they'll often have to buy their way out with bonds. Um, and that's a whole other issue that we get into in the podcast a bit more. Um, one of the things that we've been seeing in Massachusetts is um, ICE uh, kind of last minute transferring people out of our Massachusetts um, detention center, the one we have left, and just moving them around. And we see this across the country and it's um, meant to confuse supporters and family members, and it makes it harder for the asylum seeker to connect to a lawyer because all of a sudden the lawyer they were talking to no longer is able to represent them because they're in a completely different state. Um, ICE has also transitioned to an online payment portal for bonds, which is also not successful. Some states, um, the the employees are really um of of ice and and um the the place where you pay bonds physically have allowed that to continue happening um because it is this this method is just not um it's it's violent honestly against families it costs more it's um, often you have to sit at a computer all day to process this to get through. So you have to have good internet for a long period of time. And that's not something that all asylum seeker family members have. Um, last but not least, I wanted to add um, actually a good thing, a good change that has happened, which is um, work permits. Um, right now, uh, asylum seekers have to wait six months after applying for asylum before they can apply for a work permit. But one recent good change is that those work permits are coming through much faster. There is now finally an online application process and people seem to be getting them pretty quickly after. Whereas for a while there, people were having to wait three or four more months before they got their work permit. But we still have to work on this because six months is still way too long to live without a job. So um, please keep an eye out for an advocacy campaign that is launching next week to push the federal government to shorten that waiting period. It makes no sense. And it's really just about our country only wanting rich people to come and stay, right? Because I don't know about you, but I couldn't not work for six months and pay my housing costs, my food, 
on top of all the other things that asylum seekers need to pay for to pursue their their case. So those are just some updates about um, you know what's been new in this area. It is always changing. Um, keep an eye out on things. Reach out to us. Um, follow UUSC on um, Facebook, Instagram, et cetera, so you can see the latest about what's going on um, as we connect you with advocacy and opportunities to, to change these systems so we're, we're not traumatizing people that have already been traumatized. Now I'll pass it to Nauki to talk about the Olympia Brown experience, which okay. is a great band name, by the way, if we have that. So um, my name is Nauki Nakamura. Uh, I live in Racine, Wisconsin. Racine is uh, located between Chicago and Milwaukee. We're about an hour north of Chicago and maybe 45 minutes south of Milwaukee. We are located on the lake on Lake Michigan. We are a community of about 80,000 or so. So we are medium-sized or smaller-sized city. So, um, um, so that's where we are. Olympia Brown EU Church is a, a located in the downtown area. Like many EU congregations, we are a um, aging congregation, but we have had always a very active uh, social justice uh, involvement. So when the uh, needs of asylum seekers was brought to the congregation in, I believe around the spring in 2021, the uh, Social Justice Committee decided to take it on. And uh, uh, we are probably the only congregation in the city who decided to take it on because at that time, also the Afghan uh, refugee problem was occurring and many of the other congregations, including our congregation, decided to support the Afghan refugees. So um, uh, that's where we started. And uh, I, I was one of the uh, late comers to this uh, team. Uh, and uh, I joined because I'm myself, I am an immigrant. I came to the United States in 1977. I know a little bit about the difficulty of uh, at, uh, achieving uh, permanent residency status. The only reason I am able to stay here in the country is because I am married to a US citizen. And uh, so um, I thought I could bring a little bit of expertise to the team. And uh, I joined and uh, like it you know, frequently happens, uh, you end, you join at the end and pretty soon you end up at the at, at the top. And so I ended up sharing the, the task force. We initially started with a small team of five people. Um, like it is very common, uh, the people who kind of agree to are people who are involved in many other activities as well. So nobody was doing this full time. Uh, many other people were active in many other social justice projects. So we divided up the tasks in just trying to understand what it would take to support an asylum seeker. So we divided up the task about collecting information, particularly cost information and available resources in the area of housing. Uh, you know, how much does it cost to furnish an apartment, for example? You know, what kind of a food pantries we had in the city? Uh, was there any sort of a free healthcare resources available? What's public transportation? What are the bus routes and so on? And uh, we got pretty good in putting things together. And uh, we are also starting to talk about fundraising to raise the money. And uh, our goal was to raise about $20,000 to uh, support a uh, family for a year. We figured that would be what it would take. And, uh, but we didn't know really where this asylum seeker would be coming from. And that is when we stumbled into uh, CAPERS. And uh, I think that was really a stroke of luck from our perspective because uh, CAPERS really provided us a sort of the structure, the education, like uh, Laura was talking about what's the difference between asylum seeker and refugee and so forth. 
which we didn't understand, all of the paperwork that is necessary and the process that is necessary. It also um, provided us with uh, uh, a sense of uh, due diligence, you know, making sure that we are not rushing into things, that we really have the key components in place before we uh, kind of decided to move uh, forward. So they really put us back into this initial stage of discernment and says, no, are you really ready to undertake this as a congregation? Well, I think it's a hard question. And uh, uh, the um, other things that uh, Capus really provided was uh, this encouragement to move forward without having every single piece in place, right? I think Dottie Matthews, who was at that time uh, heading up Capus, she was always saying, you know, we are basically stumbling forward with that term very often because we are really feeling like we don't have no idea what the outcome will be. But I think Capus provided that kind of a structure also on an ongoing basis, uh, Capus was always there for answering some questions. I think the community and the other member congregation were open to sharing their expertise and experience. And so I was able to ask questions. So how do you deal with cars and so on? And I got a lot of input from different congregations in terms of uh, what they have been doing. So it has been great to be part of the Capus team to, uh, uh, to be, uh, for this project. So um, we did a fundraiser and uh, I will talk more about the fundraising process uh, 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 in a little bit. But then uh, we got into the phase where we were matched up with, uh, uh, with a guest or a asylum seeker. Our initial idea was that we would maybe have an individual, maybe a couple, maybe a single mom with a child or so on. So a very small unit. And we went through uh, various um, sort of uh, matchmaking procedures where we had some discussions with the asylum seekers. We talked about what kind of community we were. We probably had to sell were seen as being a, because this was now getting closer to winter, so we had to make sure that they were aware that, you know, we have snow here on the ground, <laughs> actually. And, uh, you know, we are also kind of uh, uh, seeing what kind of a people we are dealing with, what kind of languages they were speaking, did we have enough language resources on our side to deal with that. And uh, Capus was also very helpful there to kind of uh, say, you are probably as a first uh, turnaround, not able to deal with somebody who has a very significant health issues. And uh, so they kind of protected us from getting into some situation that we were really probably not able to handle or which we, we would have very difficult difficulty to, to handle. So, um, as we were waiting for a right match to come, there was a situation that developed in Houston where a family of four uh, were coming as on a, uh, uh, on a parole or humanitarian parole into the United States. They had a host family uh, in Houston, and they wanted to move to Houston because they said they, they know some people that came from their home country and lived in Houston. But the uh, uh, intended host family said, this is too big a family. We could not you know, take this. And so we were asked by papers at that time because we had, we had the money, they had the team in place, or whether we would be willing to kind of go beyond our initial goal to host the, the family of four. So uh, we had a meeting and uh, we kind of uh, agreed that we would be willing to move ahead again, stumble forward, you know, with the open hearts. And uh, I'm sure the that was the same on the asylum seekers family side. They had no idea that where 
were seen Wisconsin laws. You know, they were all there used to being living in a warmer climate. So they came to us. Um, I think on hindsight, we were very fortunate that uh, there were healthy uh, people. They were trilingual. Uh, they spoke English. They, they speak uh, uh, Spanish, and they have their native uh, um, language from, from Africa. And uh, I think we didn't have to worry about any health, uh, health concerns. It was a very uh, larger unit that we had uh, than we had originally planned for, but I think that was the challenge that we had to deal with. So um, now moving on to the sort of uh, individual items that we had to re uh, resolve. You know, I think the, the uh, order of uh, uh, the process that uh, uh, Laura explained, you know, we had to find a host family and uh, Initially, when we are looking at the ASA congregation, if there are anybody who would be having an open room or you know, maybe an empty basement and so on. And we were amazed that actually five people stepped forward and said, well, we would consider being host families. But as we went through the due diligence process, we found out that many of, um, most of these uh, uh, offers were not really right. You know, I think papers came in and looked at due diligence, they uh, interviewed the potential host families and they said, well, we probably have this one family that is capable of hosting a small unit. So that's where we started and that's when we came in. And so as we then received the offer of taking a family of four, we immediately knew that this the host family would not be a long-term solution. Uh, we kind of uh, asked many people that we knew uh, in our community if they would have, you know, maybe more room available. And we were very fortunate that one family offered us their whole house uh, for a for three months. Uh, they were renting it as an Airbnb. But they said you no. Know, if it was in the winter time, they would be able to vacate it, and they moved to Florida and spend some time there, and we could have that house for three months. So that was great. So we were bringing in the family from Houston on January thirty first, and uh, the the plan was that uh, uh, they would spend a week in the uh, initial host family's uh, basement, and then we would move move them into the um, open house. So um, it's a night when the first snow was coming to the scene. The, you know, the flight was delayed. And then uh, as the flight was coming in around 10 o'clock at around 4 p.m., I received a phone call from the host family that said, we have COVID in our house and we are not able to take the family in. So um, I, <laughs> I probably asked my wife at gunpoint, she says, you didn't really give me a choice. <laughs> you, had, you don't have a lot of time to, make, to say yes, but would it be okay if we uh, invite them to stay with us? Now, we live in a two bedroom condominium. We have, uh, well, we have a second smaller bedroom available and that's where we had the parents sleep and then the the children, you know, we made some temporary uh, beds in the living room, and that's where they stayed for a week. And uh, um, it was actually a great experience. We got to, uh, uh, we had the chance to get in family very, very well. You know, we played with the children. We had to buy them a lot of winter clothes and boots and so on. They had never seen snow. Every day the kids wanted to go out and play in the snow. And I think uh, I have never played that, that much in the snow for a very, very long time. Um, so um, and that was a very good bonding experience and it, it really helped us in the days moving forward as more challenges occurred because you know, by that time spending together in small quarters, we really established a bit of mutual trust uh, 
So um, the next uh, move then was the temporary housing. We tried to really look hard then for an apartment and it was very, very difficult to find an apartment. Uh, we have a general housing shortage and it was very difficult to explain to people, you know, here's a family of uh, asylum seekers, you know, do we say asylum seekers or not, do I understand this and so on. And again, uh, we were fortunate that one of our, our members in the congregation was having an apartment on the second floor over his, uh, in his house they were renting out. And he said, well, I could move the current renters out because um, they were not complying to the original agreement and could make that space available. And so we moved with the people into the house where they're currently living. And so, so we were very fortunate in that. Um, also, because now we had to find the money to pay for the housing, you no know, fundraising became uh, very important. And um, initially, we, you know, um, I was taught that the easiest way to raise money is just simply write a letter and ask for it. You know, you, uh, you don't have to sell cookies or so on. You know, just there are people who who are willing to support this office. And so we had a letter writing campaign. I send it uh, to all of my friends outside of the congregation and anybody we know who is uh, supporting good causes and we started to raise money that way. And there were some, you know, uh, of course we had the $20, $10 and so on, smaller donation, but we also had significant donors like we donated $1,000 or $2,000 you know, uh, uh, to support our cause. Uh, we also, I think one of the unique things we had going for us is we had some good musicians on our team or in our congregations. And uh, we organized uh, in the past year two concerts and uh, uh, we uh, sold the uh, tickets were free. Attendance was free, but, uh, and we streamed it uh, nationwide to anybody who want to see it. And uh, we said, uh, there's no admission, it's all free will offering. And uh, I think it gave us a sort of a focal point to say, rather than just asking for money, you know, we offer something like a concert, and then we can uh, have a little music, a good music, we have a chance to talk a little bit about the situation and so forth. And uh, I think the money really started flowing in, in that way. And uh, uh, on the side, we had a cookie sale, so it would give us a chance to ask for people to bake for the cookie sale and got more people involved in the effort. And uh, so it helped us branch out to a lot of different people and spreading them because it's easier to say, hey, we have a concert going, would you like to come? Uh, it's not just our musicians from our church, but it's also your church musicians are there and some locally known musicians are there. Uh, the other uh, uh, thing we did, we also uh, partnered with other congregations and uh, uh, particularly the Quaker Friends in this area were very strong supporters and also some other uh, organizations that uh, are working for unifying uh, the scene, the city of the scene, became partners in uh, in this effort. The uh, Quakers uh, came up with this idea of selling what they call uh, eco towels, which are small towelettes that made out of cloth, and we would be selling them for two dollars a piece and promoting them as substitute for paper towels. So it said, well. You could be environmental friendly and at the same time, you could be supporting uh, asylum seeker project. And that is ongoing. It doesn't make a lot of money, but at least, you know, it kind of uh, helped us raise like the food budget for a month or two. Right? So that was good. Uh, in addition to that, we, uh, we were told that if you give people a specific target to raise money, they would be opening the purse a little bit easier. So. Uh, we, did, we did that, we bought a basketball hoop for the boy, uh, one of the kids, and a basketball, 
And so uh, I, I put out a challenge to my friends. And uh, so we were able to buy that. And also we, uh, we asked for money to buy them a car and we were able to buy them a car as well. So um, I think fun fundraising turned out to be, um, well, I wouldn't say easier, but I think we, we were much more successful in raising money than we originally thought it would be, right? And uh, I think in total, we, our target was 20,000. I thought we would be happy to start the project with 10,000 in our pocket, but I think we raised in total about $25,000. So I think that was pretty good. Uh, the other challenge was transportation. Um, we do have a you know, public transportation system, which is not very good, it's a very small city. The ridership is very low. Um, also, for some reason, I think uh, the family had some problems with using public transportation because of the experiences they had in other countries before they came in right, using public transportation. So we had to arrange for a lot of rides. And uh, um, so we had a transportation um, coordinator and you know, we were fortunate to have a lot of people that says, you know, I would take the kids here or the mother here or the father here and so on. So um, that worked out well. Um, I think uh, uh, in the end, we decided that it would be maybe a lot easier to provide them with a car uh, because that would take a lot of coordination away from them. They would be less uh, dependent on us and they would uh, increase their range of uh, um, ability you know, to move around by a significant amount. So we had decided uh, to purchase them the car. Uh, the other challenge was also schooling for the two children. Um, public uh, schooling here in Racine is probably not the best, uh, to say it mildly. And but they have a bilingual program where um, uh, we were able to uh, put them in, and uh, we were also able to get uh, a couple of. Uh, tutors who volunteered one to give them math uh, instructions and another person give reading um, uh, instruction or training for the boy who was a little bit behind in his ability to keep up in, in school. Um, healthcare was a big concern because we thought, well, if there's one big um, medical emergency, it can blow our budget right? very easily. And uh, so we, tr uh, we, we do have a organization in town that provides uh, free care uh, for adults, but not for children. So we started using them. Somebody then suggested, why don't you try uh, applying for Medicaid in Wisconsin? And uh, he said, well, it's worth a try. So we applied for it. And surprisingly, we got approved. And then a week later, when we had some questions and asked, them, you know, why is it this way and that way? You were told you are actually approved by mistake. You know? And, uh, but the state is not going to take it away because the whole country is under the COVID national emergency. And we are not going to take uh, Medicaid um, uh, away from anybody at this stage. So that was really lucky because now we had access to free healthcare for the whole family. Uh, so I'm not sure if that's going to happen the next time around because I think uh, Medicaid access is probably very uh, uh, limited at this point for asylum seekers. Um, in, we also knew it was very important to find a good attorney and immigration lawyer. And uh, again, we have uh, in the scene, one of the nice uh, organization that we have is what's called the Racine Interfaith Coalition. It is a uh, coalition of, uh, I believe about 26 congregations within Racine, faith organizations. And they all work together on social justice. 
uh, issues. And they have an immigration committee, they have an education committee, they have a, like a criminal justice uh, committees and so on. And uh, so we were able to uh, get a referral from that organization of a pro bono lawyer located in Milwaukee. Uh, we compared the, um, we also got a, identified a, a experienced immigration lawyer in Chicago for the court case that we probably heard in, uh, uh, in Chicago. We had some discussion between pro bono and uh, maybe would it be worthwhile paying actually money for getting a good lawyer. And uh, uh, the concern about getting a pro bono lawyer was whether we would be sort of a considered a second class case and not getting proper attention. But it turned out to be that uh, this lawyer is wonderful. You know, you send them an email and uh, you, you get an answer back the same day. You know, that's very, very responsive. So uh, we were very fortunate with that. Um, jobs, you know, there was this discussion about um, employment authorization being uh, slow. Um, we were trying to kind of uh, keep them away from being uh, maybe abused by bad employers, you know, uh, because we know that uh, some of the undocumented uh, people uh, working under very bad conditions. So we tried to keep them away from those kind of situations. But uh, for the mother, we arranged for some cleaning uh, jobs in households. Uh, I had uh, her clean our house uh, once a week. And so at least gave her some cash income. And she used that money and saved it up. And she uh, is paying out of that money to go to school to further her uh, education. She wants to become a, a nurse. Uh, the father is uh, uh, has been mostly uh, uh, doing like uh, uh, trading, buying things, selling things, and so on. He's also a semi-professional soccer player, and uh, so he has been kind of uh, playing a hundred dollars a game before he came to the United States and he was looking for opportunities like that and said, I'm sorry, I don't know. I play soccer too. So we can play soccer together on the on the uh, field that I play with, but uh, I don't think anybody will pay you money. <laughs> so um, uh, we got him jobs uh, doing uh, uh, yard work, windows cleaning, transportation, after he got the car and so on. So he got the money. Um, finally, we got the employment authorization, which was a nightmare. We um, uh, we submitted the application on time, and we got a denial. And uh, our lawyer inquired and said, "Why the denial? We did everything right." And said, "You you applied under the wrong process, and therefore we are denying." And said, "No, this is exactly the way your website said the way we should do it." But anyway, they wouldn't budge. And so um, we had to uh, engage our U.S. senator in, in our state, and uh, she was able to have a staff member uh, advocate on our behalf to finally have the immigration office admit that there was a mistake on their part, and uh, which was probably like pulling teeth, and uh, allowed us to resubmit. So it took us probably six months from submission to finally get the employment authorization. So those are probably the major challenges. And we found out that uh, with good uh, uh, reaching out to various organizations that we would be able to do this. Um, but I think in the overall, the uh, positives are we have uh, found out that there's an amazing number of good people out there, and we felt that we were blessed with all the support we have received. We have learned a lot about why asylum seekers leave their home. We have learned about the complexity and frustration of going through the U.S. immigration system, and we gained a new family. You know, they're now part of our family. So. Thank you so much for sharing all of that. That was really incredible to hear the details of how you did this at Olympia Brown. 
We have a few minutes left. If we have any questions, you're very welcome to put them in the chat and we would love to answer them for you. And if we don't have any questions, we might just ask ourselves questions. <laughs> yeah, I think we we are starting to consider maybe moving on for the next um, group, right? And so we are asking ourselves, if we had to do it over again, what would we do differently? Mm. Right? And uh, I think the yeah, probably two things that immediately come to mind is we would probably build a larger team. You know, I think we, we feel like that we have five people, but some people, you know, through a variety of reasons, dropped out. Some of them joined us. So, um, uh, so we would probably start with that, reaching out to other congregation, perhaps, and asking them, would you kind of do this jointly rather than, and that would also allow us to open up the um, the candidates for host families because we find it maybe difficult to find another host family in our own congregation. The other thing that we probably would do differently is we would probably buy a car sooner and raise the money for that. And really, I think, you know, in the Midwest, in the small town, you know, everybody has two or three cars, right? I mean, without a car, there's not much we can do. So, yeah. So those are the two I can see would probably be different. One of the things that I love about this program, um, it has been also that it is a learning community, right? Um, so again, I think every Capus congregation that I've worked with, that is a question they ask. Like, what would we, and not in an accusatory way, not like there's anything that people did wrong, but like, how can we learn from this experience now and maybe be even better prepared? Um, and, you know, I'd just like to call back again to um, what Laura mentioned that that when folks, when a congregation becomes a campus co congregation, they are invited to a monthly call with folks from other campus congregations um, to learn from each other, work through issues. Um, and, you know, along with some of the trainings that we we provide it's also learning from each other because um you know racing you there might be folks in in other more rural places that need to hear that and they can actually get moving on that earlier because of your of your experience now key and that's super really really helpful to do that work and to know we're in this together so amen to that <laughs> I want to thank you for joining us this evening. Um, we will be, we have been recording this, so this will be online. So um, if you'd like to watch it again, or if you weren't able to join us in real time, that's absolutely fine. We're going to have this up on the website soon. Um, our thanks to Alejandro, who's been our tech wizard behind the scenes. We're very grateful. <laughs> um, and Alejandro, if you wouldn't mind putting up that last slide that shows folks how you can get in touch with us. And I see that you're also putting some resources in the chat. Thank you so much. And that's where you can find us. Um, we have our form that you could fill out if you're interested in doing that. You can read more about CAPUS if you go to uusc.org slash CAPUS, and you can email us at CAPUS at uusc.org. I'll also say there's two, you know, also if you haven't watched or read or listened to, sorry, the podcasts, they are really helpful resources and we have an article in the most recent UU World about this program. So um, also check that out. Hopefully you're on that list and we'll get that magazine. You'll see us there. Um, and there's just lots of ways to learn more and hopefully connect to this really, really important work. Thank you so much, everyone. Really appreciate it. Thank you for your support. Diane, appreciate that too. <laughs> All right, we're going to call it there. Looking forward to being in touch with many of you in the future. Please reach out. Thanks, Thank everyone. You all. Thank you.
Good night.